Grace to you and peace, mercy and joy from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope your lives and your living are being blessed with that grace and peace and mercy and joy in this season in the midst of, I don't know how busy your lives are and how hectic things are, what all is going on. For some reason it seems like December just kind of takes everything and crunches it all together in just kind of concentrated time. But in the midst of all that, I'm hoping that you're experiencing the reality that you are the reason for the season. I know all the slogans say Jesus is the reason for the season, and that's true. But I believe even more so, you're the reason, I'm the reason he came into this world. I'm the reason that he needed to come into this world. I really am. And I believe you are too. We all needed to have what he was coming to bring us. A relationship restored back to God. As we look at these themes during this month of December, the month of December up to Christmas is called Advent. The word Advent means coming. And we celebrate two comings for the season of Advent. We, we, we prepare for the first coming of Jesus that we call Christmas. But all of the readings so often remind us that there is a second coming. Christ is coming back. For us, for his people, to take us into eternity with him. But in the meantime, we live this side of heaven. And as we do, there are some realities that we, that we face. It's been that way since almost the beginning of time, since man and woman fell into sin. And there have been things that we've had to deal with. Isaiah is a prophet back in the day and received the word that he was to share from God. So there was a time when the prophet was saying in our text today, cry out. God said, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? What do you want me to cry? And the crying is kind of like, we might picture it like a town crier. Cape Girardeau has a town, kind of a ceremonious kind of town crier that on special occasions in the city uh, has, hear ye, hear ye, and reads a proclamation or reads a special kind of citation to recognize the event or what have you that's about to happen. The town crier. It's along that same line. Or we've all heard the story of the boy who cried wolf too many times. It was fake until the time when it was really real and then there was a problem. There was an issue. Or we've all had cry babies, not so much. I, I love babies that cry. I mean, there, that's, you know, that happens. God bless that. But for us older babies, when we start being cry babies, it's like, oh, we don't want anything to do with a cry baby, right? Or for crying out loud, that expression. How many times have we heard that said, for crying out loud? But this is a sincere plea from the prophet. After he's heard the word cry, what do you want me to cry? Cry what? Well, there are really two cries in our reading today. The first cry is a cry of withering grass. Grass equals people. Grass is people. All people are like grass. All people are like grass. Our text says, all men are like grass. That really means people, not just us guys, but all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. So it becomes obvious that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is wanting us to realize that we are very, very temporary. We're no more permanent than the weeds out there in a the field in a hot wind that can be just take those weeds out in a, in a little bit. Our days on earth are like grass, the psalmist says, like wildflowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we're gone as though we had never been here. It's all good news this morning, isn't it, in the midst of this Advent season? You're feeling really good about, boy, I feel great. Thanks a lot for this really good news, Pastor Short. I really needed this. In a way, we all need this. This temporariness is God's will and plan. This isn't just out there. 
This is God's plan. Going back to what I was saying earlier, I believe that the reason we're all kind of temporary this side of heaven is that God desires us to be in the original relationship in which he created us, to be in a permanent, eternal relationship, uh, perfect, together with himself. And that's the way we were created. God intended everything at the beginning essentially to be permanent, particularly us men and women, to live in that eternal relationship. But we blew that and we turned everything into temporariness when we fell into sin. And But God wasn't happy with that, with that result. So he even there in Genesis 3, with talking about a seed that will come, begins to set up a promise and a covenant that he will send someone in to restore the relationship that has been broken so that we could be in a relationship with him because of his love for us. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus coming into this world is a fulfillment of that promise. Isaiah becomes one of the prophets along the way that keeps pointing people to the coming, to that coming, to that first coming. There's someone coming. The prophets of the Old Testament talked about things of the immediate situation, things a little further out, and then things far out. But ultimately, always talking about the coming of the Messiah for the redemption of the world. That was coming. He was coming, this Messiah. So this is God's plan. The grass withers, the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord. The breath of the Lord blows on them. So all the things that we're buying, all the things that we will receive this season and give away and give to others, they're all temporary. Think about that. You know, when we get out the debit card or the credit card or the cash, we write the check, we hit the button on the computer that says, you know, we click buy. Think about that. It's temporary. No matter how important it may seem for the moment, and it may be very important for the moment, it may incredibly be incredibly important and valuable to us for the time being for the time being, but it is not eternal. It is not eternal. And I think that kind of gives us, you know, we need to kind of put that behind everything that we're doing, that we're remembering, it is not eternal. You know, it, it's, just, it's just there. It's kind of like the song, Time Marches On by Tracy Lawrence, that old country song that he sang, Time Marches On. Sister cries out, from her baby bed, brother runs in, fa father's in his bed, mama's in her room, learning how to sew, daddy's drinking beer, listening to the radio, Hank Williams sings Kalija and Dear John, time marches on, time marches on. Got it ringing in your head a little bit, those of you country fans? Time marches on. The song goes on to tell how time changes. As brother turns to dope, Mom gets depressed, and Dad has a girlfriend, and then ends up getting buried beneath the maple tree. It's country. It's just that raw. It's just how country goes. Then the transition comes in. South moves north. North moves south. A star is born. A star burns out. And all things that stays the same as everything changes, everything changes. So goes the song. We do really need to consider this when it comes to our priorities in life. We need to consider this temporariness. Can there be anything in our lives that will last, that will endure forever? Well, the good news is yes. There is reason to have hope, which brings us to our second cry, the cry of a lasting word, of a lasting word. The word word is extremely important. In the Bible, it's extremely important. The Word of God lasts and stands forever. The Word of God endures forever, it says at the end of our, in verse 8 of our text. The Word of God endures forever. Now, as we move, turn the pages forward and move into the New Testament, into the book of John, one of the, one of the apostles, one of the gospels, the very first chapter of John, very first few verses. It talks about the word, word. 
And it really identifies, it personifies the word as being Jesus, as we can see. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. Now, if I go back and in place of the word word, use the word Jesus. In the beginning, the Jesus already existed, really the Son of God. The Son of God existed. The Son of God was with God, and the Son of God was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Son of God gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. Jesus is the Word of God. There's the blank there. Now, a verse that we quote a lot during this time of the year for Christmas really brings together who the Word is. And the Word became a human being. Or we often, the Word became flesh. And lived here with us. We saw His true glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. From Him all the kindness and all the truth of God have come down to us. It's a great truth in the book of John. Jesus promises in His Word that His work becomes ours through faith in the Word. So, backing up a bit, I believe that we need to remember our temporariness. Tennis champion Hannah Mondacova was once asked how she felt about defeating great players like Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett Lloyd. She responded, you know, well, it, you know, any big win means that all the suffering, all the practicing, and the traveling are all worth it. I feel like I own the world. When asked how long that feeling lasts, she replied, about two minutes. How real that is. The Bible tells us that the fleeting nature of fame and fortune and of really everything around us, including our own selves and all the stuff we have. I believe the take home of this for us, besides just thinking about this, the take home for this is, as you think about all the things that you're giving, uh, and there's bound to be somebody in your life that you're concerned about. What's going to finally last after all is said and done, when this world comes to an end in whatever way it does, whatever goes away, when this universe comes to an end perhaps, whatever comes to an end, there will only be two things left, we're told in the Scriptures. The Word of God and the souls of mankind. That's it. Nothing else will be here. So do, as we look around at all of our stuff and all of our possessions, nothing wrong with those, but they are not permanent. So as we think about this season of giving and this season of sharing, I want you to think of somebody, and I'm sure that won't take long for you, to, there's somebody in your mind right now that you're concerned about as to where they're going to be, where will their soul be when Christ comes in His second coming and separates the believers from the unbelievers. And the believers get to go to be in that permanent relationship with God in paradise, in heaven. And then the text says that those others, the non-believers, will go to be in that place prepared for Satan and his angels. Not God, it, it is true of true fact, God did not create hell for human beings. He did not. He only created hell for Satan and his angels. But those who decide to go the way of Satan as non-believers choose to go to the dwelling place of Satan on their own. What about your own relationships? What about mine? Is there somebody that we're going to be sending a Christmas card to, a greeting, or giving a gift to, that maybe we're a little concerned about their salvation, so to speak, their soul, and their very temporariness? I believe part of our calling of God is to help populate heaven. And you've heard me tell the story of Vicki and how Vicki invited me to. She didn't preach a sermon. She didn't do any fancy witnessing. She just invited me to go to Sunday school. I guess she could have been Buddhist and I'd have gone with her. I was five years old and she was five. Wherever Vicky went, I went. Right after, we were just really good friends. She happened to be Christian, 
and Missouri Senator Lutheran. So here I am. You're never too young and you're never too old, first of all, to think for yourself as to what, Lord, thank you for the relationship that you've come to have with me. But Lord, I'm concerned about this other person. Whatever person's on your mind, whatever person's rising to your mind right now, I want you to think about that person and I want you to, number one, pray for that person. Don't want us to do any kind of condemning I just want us to have some compassion for that person and to think about the permanence of their future, of their life. Do you want them to go to heaven with you? Do you want to welcome them into heaven or do you want them to go there? Maybe they, Vicky's ahead of me. Vicky's already died and she's already there and she's going to say, hey, Paul, it took you long enough. Welcome aboard. I can just hear her. What about you? In this season, I'd really like for us to think about this. Lord Jesus, would you cause us, you've given us all different ways of talking and different ways of communicating. You've shaped every one of us here in all kinds of different ways. But Lord, we're here to be in touch with your love for us, and we thank you for that. We thank you that whatever little faith we may have, Lord, it counts. You take our unbelief, and you help us with that. And Lord, you take whatever faith we have and you use that to draw us into relationship with you because any of us who believe in you have eternal life. But Lord, help us to help others to know you in this season of your coming, of both of your comings. Let us be ready to give reason for the hope and the real joy that's inside of us. Let us find ways to meet up, to hook up wherever it might be at our favorite refreshment place, our favorite traveling place, our favorite golf course, our favorite court, our favorite workout, our favorite path to walk, to bike, to run, whatever it might be, to hook up with somebody and in some way, Lord, give a message of encouragement, a message of faith, a message of your word of Jesus in that person's life. And then, Lord, it's all yours. Then you take those words and you take that witness and then you use it to touch their heart, to touch their soul. Lord, would you be with us this season? Help us to have that joy and the grace and the peace that comes with it. But then help us to be able to share some of that around with your word of your great love, not only for us, but for everyone out there. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.